Hey guys, thanks for joining us. This is the Rude with Auto Marketplace. So today we're going to talk about uh, a big uh, story out of the insurance industry. I should say a developing story out of the insurance industry, um, which is very important for basically drivers, fleets, Uber, Lyft, a, a lot of different people. It's a very technical subject, but a very important subject. So let's get right into it. So uh, and for those who don't follow our content, what we usually do is we draft up an article. And then this video that we're doing right now, we we're basically speaking to the article. It's actually not that long of an article, but it's it's dense, but we'll explain it. And then we embed this video we're doing that you're watching right now uh, into the article. So let's get right into it. Okay, so the title of the article is American Transit, uh, parentheses, officially insolvent. Historic Q2 loss implies TLC insurance giant American Transit is insolvent. Will regulators and or the Tax and Limousine Commission step in? what it could mean for NYC drivers, fleets, brokers, Lyft, and Uber. Okay, so here are the bullet points. American Transit Insurance Company, ATIC, uh, it's often abbreviated to ATIC, uh, has an over 60% NYC for higher transport insurance market share and could be considered too big to fail. Basically, with too big to fail references is that during the financial crisis, there are certain institutions like... Um, you know, like an institution, financial institutions like banks or insurance companies, if you let them fail, they're so big that they would have a systemic impact. So like if you left Lehman Brothers fail, then, you know, they have a lot of counterparties that, you know, it could be a huge domino effect that have impacts the whole system. So that is what's meant by that phrase too big to fail. So why I'm why I'm using it here is that Attic has a 60 percent market share in the TLC commercial liability insurance market. So it could be considered too big to fail, meaning that if you let it fail, if it has a 60% market share, it, have, it, would, it would have a systemic impact, um, potentially. Based on recent financial filing, Attic appears to be technically insolvent. We'll get into that. Bullet point three, in our understanding, New York State insurance regulator, the Department of Financial Services, abbreviated to DFS often, must now decide to either help rehabilitate Attic or move to liquidate Attic. Bullet point four, NYC TLC drivers uh, and fleets could face large premium increases after already facing large premium increases, which we covered last year of 10 to 30 percent plus. TL uh, TLC insurance brokers lower commissions uh, could face large premium increases. TLC insurance brokers lower commissions, but competition might enter marketplace. We'll explain that. And then last point, thousands of NYC drivers and fleets at risk of losing TLC plates do the inability to acquire or just afford insurance. So they could acquire the insurance, but it's just so expensive that they can't practically afford it. Okay, so let's begin the article. TLC insurance giant American Transit Attic continues to make headlines, not the good kind. Based on a recent publicly available financial statement, Attic has recognized a historic uh, negative over $700 million loss in Q2 uh, 2024. So the second quarter ending June 30th, 2024 for Attic. Um, basically, American Transit, so in simple English, American Transit has indicated the estimated cost of its claims are much, much higher than previously disclosed. In our understanding, the loss means Attic is technically insolvent. In other words, if American Transit had to pay out claims it estimates it might be liable for, it wouldn't have enough money to the tune of over $650 million. Okay, so this is the publicly available financial statement we referred to. Uh, and so just to sim, I know this can get like, you know, this seems overwhelming, but it's just very simple if you kind of get to the basics of this financial statement. So see here it just says underwriting income. So this is the statement of income. So the income statement of the insurance company of Attic. So premiums earned. So direct written, I think this re references like, the annual amount written. So they're writing about $306, $307 million worth of premiums, but obviously because they're earning it on a month by month basis, they recognize it as they earn the premium, but at least that how, how I interpret this financial statement. So year to date, meaning for the first six months, out of that $308 million, $370 million they have written in premiums, they have earned or collected $189 million. At least that's how I read this income statement. Okay, so that's just the premiums earned. So the loss is incurred. So this is, you know, the payouts, you could say, to be simple. I mean, it, it could get more complicated than that. And then the different adjustments. So basically, the net underwriting gain or loss 
for the year to date, so this is for the first six months, not the Q2, is negative $730 million. And so if you layered that on to, if you wrote $189 million, of, if you collected $189 million of premium, but your loss is, you know, uh, more than 3x that amount, that that's that's a cra that's crazy basically. Um, so obviously something else is going on and what basically is going on. So that's the income statement is the balance statement. What's basically going on is that previous, uh, previous reserves for losses, like basically previous estimates of what American transit owed, they, uh, they basically underestimated by a lot. So they owe a lot more basically. And so, here, I think this is the key thing. So surplus as regard to policyholders is in the balance sheet of American transit. So this is what I mean by technically insolvent. So they have a deficit, a negative surplus of negative, negative $678 million. So basically to be very simple about it, if, if all of a sudden American transit had to pay out all the claims that it estimates it needs to pay out, it's going to be 677 78 million dollars short that's what that means that's obviously unacceptable from a regulatory perspective from an insurance company perspective it's a very big deal to have a negative 770 million dollar deficit especially layered onto the fact that if the company's writing 300 million dollars of premiums a year to have this big of a deficit that that's a major issue Okay, hopefully I explained that well. Obviously, if you have comments or questions about what I'm saying, just leave a you know comment in our YouTube or in our Substack. So let's continue on, continue on with the article. In fact, according to insurance industry executives we spoke to, who also cited reporting by S&P Global's Tim Zawacki, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, American Transit's loss is the largest downward quarterly revision for an individual U.S. property and casualty, often referred to as PNC insurance company in the last 15 years. The underwriting loss was so large that it meaningfully impacted stats that measure the health of the entire U.S. commercial auto liability market. For those who've been following the American transit story, the historic loss might not be surprising. We've written about this and obviously all of these hyperlinks, you can click on it and it'll go to previous articles or, you know, S&P, you know, so we won't click on every single hyperlink, but you, you can click on it if you want more details. Given previous independent actuarial findings, do, what that term, just to double click on what that term actuary or actuarial mean, just to be very simple about it, an actuary is basically um, a, a, an, insur uh, an insurance financial, uh, financial analyst, a financial analyst, a trained financial analyst that basically focuses on the insurance industry. So what an actuary will do is they'll build models or they'll try to estimate uh, like future losses uh, and, you know, how to predict that. So, for example, in American transit case, in, in, in American transit's case, their actuaries will try to predict that, okay, if we give insurance to this person, what are his, his or her, there's estimated loss runs. And so when an independent actuary comes in, which we're going to talk about, they'll assess America in an independent way. They'll assess American Transit's estimated actuarial findings, meaning like what they think they're going to have to pay out, and uh, you know, and then draw a conclusion. So I hope I hope I explained that right. But that's what actuary means, basically, in a very simple way. So in fact, other insurers and Uber, which is currently suing Addict, so Uber we've covered this as suing Addict might be encouraged to see the losses officially being recognized. That being said, while we recently reported that Uber and American Transit might be heading towards a settlement based on legal filings, our interpretation was likely naive and optimistic. So what we're referring to is we did an article in July last month saying based on some legal filings that we dug up, it seemed to indicate that uh, and then, you know, there's reference. That's how big the, uh, mark, the market share is. Obviously, it's a huge market share. We got some, uh, there, was, there was this legal document that kind of implied a settlement was being reached. Uh, here it says the parties do not currently propose any using any alternative dispute resolution mechanism in this case. Uh, so after speaking to uh, more people and assessing that, maybe that's just like a technicality. Maybe a settlement is very far from being reached. And it's just like the judge saying, you know, try to 
figure this out outside the court system or in a, you know, like an arbitration, but maybe we're just optimistic. Like maybe we were making too big of something that wasn't there, or maybe we're right. You never know. But I just want to flag that. In fact, given of the above financial disclosure, so the disclosure that it's in a seven, you know, nearly $700 million deficit, we're not even sure where Attic would come up with the money to pay any meaningful financial settlement, even if Uber succeeds in its legal action against the company. So our point there, think about it this way. If Attic right now is sitting on a negative $700, $678 million deficit, even if Uber won its legal case, does Attic even have the money to pay Uber out whatever Uber feels that it's owed? So even like, so that's even, is the deficit even larger actually? That's another question to layer on, but so, I mean, just something to consider. So here's some quotes from, this is way back in 2021. So mo more than four years ago, June, 2021. So Ronald uh, Kuhn, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, of Huggins Actu Actuarial Services, again, that term, in a statement of actuarial opinion said the 190 million provision for unpaid loss and loss adjustment expenses made by American Transit Insurance Company, Attic, is 509 million less than the 698 million he considered the minimum necessary. Using his estimate, Coin said American Transit statutory policyholders surplus would render it insolvent by 431 million. So this is by S&P Global, Tom Jacobs, from Terry Leone, June 4th, 2021. So think about this way. And then they had an updated one, I think last year, the, the same Ronald Kuhn. Um, so this was four years ago and they said, well, the deficit's 431 million. Okay, well now, sorry. Now the deficit's 678 million. So the deficit's only growing bigger. That's like a nightmare situation for a regulator to see that. So maybe that's why they finally, you know, kind of put a microscope to the situation and said, okay, what's really going on? Let's start, you know, let's really dig into this. So then uh, we had written back in February said, furthermore, and this is another part of the article that sets up the next part of the article. Furthermore, if the dominant player can continue to operate at razor thin margins for years or is indeed effectively insolvent, again, this is in February, that is a nightmare competitive backdrop. Right now, our guess is Warren Buffett controlled. Geico is probably not interested in the NYC tax insurance market. Okay, so, and we'll get, we'll get into that uh, down there, but just as a very, basically, there's so many different sides of this story. So a big complaint for Attic, especially in terms of like why competition is not entering the NYC TLC insurance market, is if you have a market share player that basically can insolvently operate and, you know, what, what I mean by that is like, let's say the real premium to make uh, for higher transportation liability insurance work is should be 7,000 on average. So in order for a rival or a new competitor to compete, the minimum they'd have to charge is 7,000. But if Attic can, you know, offer a policy at 5,000 that you can't compete with that, but the only way they're offering the $5,000 policy is they're just underestimating their losses and they're insolvent. So that's what I mean by that, where as long as you have this insolvent market player, it was preventing competition from entering, but also the benefit you could say is that it was artificially, um, keeping prices lower. Actually, I know it's, it's very, a lot of people are like, what do you mean lower? We're you know, people are paying so much drivers and fleets. So we'll get into that. Okay. And again, this article is actually not that long. It's just dense. So, you know, we're the articles almost, you know, it's concluding impacts premium is going up. One thing we want to avoid is speculating too much, or at least too aggressively on what addicts recent financial disclosures mean for the NYC for our transportation. TLC insurance marketplace. We can share and reshare a few facts and uncontroversial observations. American Transit, based on TLC data and our analysis, has an over 60% share of the NYC TLC commercial auto liability insurance market. So that's the too big to fail point we're making, that it's, it's a huge market player. NYC TLC premiums increase, and you can click these hyperlinks, and at the very end of this um, uh, video, we'll, we'll show you these articles, but you know, we won't go over every single article. NYC TLC premiums increased 10% to 30% year over year from 2023 to 2024. 
This inflation is also, in our opinion, not correctly being reflected in the NYC driver minimum pay formula. No, it might be changing soon. So, so what we mean by that is there's this minimum pay formula that's supposed to reflect inflation. And it only increased, I think, 3.49% this year, 3.5%. But if insurance, which is a major expense for drivers and fleets, is inflating at 10 to 30% a year, obviously a 3.5% increase is not reflecting that inflation. That the inflation metric they're using is probably a little is flawed. Um, but to TLC's credit, in the regulatory agenda, they're gonna they implied that they were gonna look into that formula. Okay, bullet point three here. We understand. Attic is cutting TLC insurance broker commissions, given its marketplace dominant. TLC focused insurance brokers might be experiencing or could experience significant financial headwinds. Okay, so what we mean by that is think about it from this angle. So you have, you know, these TLC insurance brokers, and how that works is that, you know, for originating the policy and they have overheads, they have sales and marketing expense, they have employees, they have to do driver changes. If a claims happens, they have to manage that. For that, American Transit, let's say, historically paid them 7% or 8% commission on the premiums. But then they have overhead. So that's not profit, but that's the revenue they're generating. If Attic is, and we understand this from speaking to a few uh, brokers, because Attic is now illiquid and now the regulator is probably going hard on them. In order to save money, they might be, it appears that they're cutting the broker commissions from, let's say, 7 or 8% to 5%. That's huge. Because a, um, a a broker, if it's 60% or 80% of their book and the revenue and they used to make 7% and went to 5%, although it only looks like 2%, let's use a simple example of like, let's say uh, a broker made a million dollars of premium. So they would earn 70,000 uh, from American Transit. Just a simple example at 7%. If now the broker fee is 5%, the 70,000 went to uh, 50,000 on a revenue basis, that's 20,000. So that's like, you know, like 25%, uh, uh, no, almost 30, 25 to 30% revenue decrease. Think that's huge for that broker. And the more scaled players might be benefit or able to navigate that situation. But, uh, you know, if for smaller brokers, they're, they're probably under a lot of financial stress is our guess. And so there might be some consolidation amongst the brokers. And um, so that's another angle to this that, you know, a lot of people might, might not be thinking about it. Okay, last bullet point here. If American Transit were forced into liquidation without working with other insurers or coming up with an affordable government supported last resort, we'll explain all of this option. Or if I'll edit this later. Or if coming up with an affordable government support last resort option is not implemented correctly, multiple players in the NYC for higher transportation marketplace, drivers, fleets, brokers, Uber, and Lyft would face significant operational challenges. Okay, so let's explain what we mean. What are we talking about liquidation and, you know, last resort? What does all of this mean? So let's make this simple. So we've now we've already shown you the financials where American Transit is technically insolvent, meaning that the claims that it has to pay out, it's, it doesn't have the money to pay out all the potential claims to the tune of that $678 million, which we, which we already went over. And the actuaries also had determined that before. Okay. So this becomes the issue. The regulator is seeing that. And, you know, the New York State insurance regulator it's like a banking regulator. They obviously, this is a major problem because they can't continue to the, allow American Transit to operate like this because like we so, saw the deficit in 2021 based on the actuarial assumption was 400 whatever million, now it's 700 million. So if you keep on letting the, the company op, the attic operate as is, that deficit is getting larger and larger and larger. And you know, there is a like a emergency fund that the state has, but they would have to come out of pockets, basically the taxpayers base, effectively the taxpayers ba partially bailing out an insurance company in a way. Um, so the regulator has to take an action. If, a, a, you know, it's like a bank, if a bank is insolvent, a regulator will take over the bank, you know, the FDIC or the state regulator. Um, so Based on a discussion with insurance industry executives and experts, and then please use the comment section to correct us if we have it wrong. So this is 
our research, we're talking to people who are uh, executives in the industry who are experts, you know, um, so that's how we're, we're coming up with this. So if we have it wrong, just let us know, but we're trying our best. Um, based on our discussion with insurance industry executives and experts, if an insurer can't pay out the claims it prospectively owes, New York State's insurance regulator, uh, NYS, D D New York State DFS, Department of Financial Services, will usually take one of the following two actions. So if a regulator is insolvent, they'll either rehabilitate the insurance company to make it stable or solvent eventually, or they'll liquidate the insurance company, meaning that they'll wind it down. Okay, so here's the, the law that says it like, it's very technical, but it's basically saying that if there's a mandatory control level event, and in our interpretation, what that basically means in simple English is that if like there's a, a huge loss that an insurer recognizes like Attic, which what makes it technically insolvent that's a that's a mandatory control level event the regulator needs to get involved now the superintendent which is basically the chair of the regulator shall take such actions as are necessary to cause the insurer to be placed under rehabilitation or liquidation and then you know this is from fine law and a new york state insurance law and uh, a lot of insurance industry executives you know help flag this for us so thank you for those people they know who they are um, since American transit is such an important market share player, we think the regulator will act in a potentially unique way. After all, after all, as we've mentioned before, Attic is essentially too big to fail. If the DFS moves to liquidate the 60% market share player in an abrupt manner, that will likely cause major problems. We assume the DFS and TLC already know this. So they're not dumb to this fact. Well, again, we're making the same points are to you know, beat a dead horse, as they say, but we're basically saying that to liquidate the 60% market share player, especially in an abrupt manner, without backup. And what we mean, I, I sorry, I should have mentioned last resort basically means that, okay, let's say they liquidate American transit, then the government and, and the key word I bolded affordable last resort. So a last resort option is basically, let's say in Florida, you know, I think the East coast of Florida has been hit by Let's make this larger. Let's say I think recently, like the East Coast of Florida, I don't know Florida that well, but like below Tampa Bay or whatever it was, they got hit by those hurricanes. So let's say for two seasons in a row, like a big hurricanes hit it, huge losses for the insurance companies involved. They might eventually say like, we can't insure these houses anymore. So let's say if someone doesn't have a mortgage, okay, maybe they know they can risk not having home insurance. But if someone has a mortgage on a house, sometimes it's a requirement to have homeowners insurance, like the lender requires that. So if there's no options in the market, that becomes a very tricky situation. So the government might create a insurance, like a, like a last resort. That's why it's often called that a last resort option where a consumer can buy from that government backed insurance company. The only issue is sometimes these government backed insurance companies, the premiums are unaffordable basically. Um, so, not only would you have to create, if you let American Transit liquidate, you'd have to create a, a backup insurer, but that it would have to be at affordable premiums. And if American Transit was off, is insolvent because the, it, it could be insolvent, technically insolvent for multiple reasons, but let's say two main reasons are the premiums were underpriced, so it could gain that 60% market share and they were underestimating the losses. So if American Transit's average liability premium is 5,000 right now, that's, it just implies that that no one is not popular, but it's probably not a sustainable premium. So then if you create a government supported last resort option, but the premiums are $10,000, you're still going to have an issue because a lot of people can't afford that. So we'll get into uh, more of what we're talking about. So uh, for example, let's say, and we're repeating what we just said, let's say 25% of the TLC drivers and fleets can't afford insurance from marketplace alternatives such as Hereford or Insure. Thousands of drivers and fleets will lose their TLC places, also known as for hire vehicle FHV licenses. They will lose their ability to make income. If they lose those licenses, those, those plates, they can't, you know, do Uber, Lyft or any base work in New York City for hire transport work. And they will be deactivated by insurance. So if you can't be insured, you can't work in the industry and then you lose your livelihood in this industry, at least. Um, and so that's a major problem, you know, with letting American transit liquidate. 
It said, that being said, the regulator DFS will likely not allow a technically insolvent insurance company to continue to write policies and collect insurance premiums in New York State without major corrective actions. One could reasonably conclude that the regulator might force Attic to come up with a detailed future business plan and track its progress closely. Will this mean American Transit, in turn, competitors will increase premiums? Probably. Does this mean Attic, in turn, competitors will try to reduce costs via cutting broker slash agent fees? Probably. The unpopular truth in all of this, and very few want to hear this, is TLC commercial auto liability insurance is likely underpriced. Yes, that you're you're not hearing that wrong. It's very expensive, but it still could be underpriced. However, or just needs a new competitor. That's another way to view it. That might be more efficient to price it better. Anyways, however, an NYC driver or fleet can only afford so much. For example, if a true sustainable insurance premium is a price only 40% of the marketplace can afford, what do you do? It points to deeper issues that need to be addressed at the state and city level, such as cracking down on lawsuit lending practices or disincentivizing frivolous insurance claims. And so we'll go over what we all just said, but there was a, a really interesting NYC council hearing where uh, the Taxi and Limousine uh, Commission Chair David Doe was testifying. And so there was a city council member, and you can obviously, there's a public hearing, but uh, you can click on the, the link. So this council member, uh, Lincoln Wrestler, I think his full name is, he asked the TLC chair, David Doe, are you finding any issues in your review of the actuarial rates, again, that term, in your conversations with the New York's Department of Financial Services, DFS? So Chair Doe says, I think this is a little bit counterintuitive to what you're thinking. You're saying the, you know, the insurance rates are high. We're saying the insurance rates are artificially low. And then just to conclude this, it might also, it also might mean the actuarial leeway given to drivers measured on loss runs. So what loss runs are, are basically like the, uh, the claims paid out in a policy. So like if you paid $50,000 in ins uh, you know, insurance premiums over the last eight, nine years or something, what are the, you know, the claims payouts related to that? And you can, so I don't know, just to make it simple, if you paid $100,000 of insurance premiums over a certain number of years, and there is $50,000 of claim payouts related to incidences, whether it's your fault or not your fault, your loss run is 50%. If it was zero, your loss run is 0%. If it was 70,000 uh, in payouts, your loss run is 70%. Obviously, if it's higher than the premiums you paid, you have a more than 100% uh, loss run, loss ratio, I should say. So it also might mean the actual leeway given to drivers measured on loss runs might be significantly uh, uh, reduce. For example, if a driver has two or more at fault accidents or even one major at fault accident, they might not be able to drive in the NYC prior transport marketplace. Once again, using deactivated by insurance. Okay. Let's let's, I think a lot of people probably are following along, but let me just explain this a little bit. Let, let me just reiterate it because this is a very important point. So what I'm basically saying here is that, and it's kind of like to the previous point. So let's say the five, the four or $5,000 premium is not a sustainable premium. And the only way it's been offered is because this illiquid player was allowed to offer this premium. But if the real premium is, I don't know, $8,000, but if 40% of the, if 60%, if whatever percentage of the marketplace cannot like just simply cannot afford to pay 8,000 a year, then that's, that's that the structurally you can't allow that at least abruptly, because that's going to impact the entire industry. People are going to lose their TLC plates because they can't get insurance, whether they can't get insurance or they can't afford insurance. Um, so our point is that, you know, there are these other things which we covered called lawsuit lending, which is basically like frivolous, not every single lawsuit lending case is frivolous. I don't mean to say that, but basically it's like, you know, ambul quote unquote, ambulance chaser type lawyers trying to extract money from minor claims to make them huge claims, you know, which creates a bad insurance environment. And, you know, everybody's impacted by that. So they might have to start cracking down more heavily on that as well. So like there has to be maybe some structural changes because you can only raise the premium so much, you know, maybe something is flawed with the structure of what's going on in the New York state insurance landscape. You know, there's, it's a no fault state. So maybe some, uh, things need to happen around that. 
uh, it's a more technical insurance point. Then the other point is that, okay, if so, let's say DFS says, okay, we're not going to liquidate you addict, but we're, we're going to now track you very closely to make sure this deficit doesn't grow. So remember 2001, they said the deficit's four hundred million or a little more than four hundred million dollars. And now four years later, the deficit is seven hundred million dollars. So, you know, before you know it, it's going to be a billion dollars. So the, obviously the regulator can't let that happen. So what they might force attic underwriters to do and also the other insurers is saying that, OK, the actuarial leeway, meaning that if you have a driver uh, who gets into an at fall accident or, you know, has a pedestrian incident, whether it's their fault or not their fault, they might just say, like, listen, we can't underwrite you because, the you know, we're just not willing to do it because we can't afford to in our our, our perspective loss runs right might be ridiculous. Now that could be fair or unfair, but they might get a lot more strict about that. Now in a recent TLC public hearing, there were several drivers who actually mentioned this point where the point they were mentioning is like, let's say you're a driver and you're dropping off a passenger and then the passenger opens, uh, opens the door and then like a, he, they open the door without looking, you know, if there's some, if a bicyclist is passing or maybe the bicyclist is at fault, but let's say the bicyclist is not at fault and they open the door and then the bicyclist runs into the door. That's actually going to be on the driver in many instances. And then that driver could have this massive claim when it was, let's say in that instance, it was mostly the passenger's fault, not the driver's fault. But then that driver has a massive insurance premium increase or they can't even get insurance. They lose their TLC plate. And so it becomes this disaster situation. So it's just something to track, you know, uh, these dynamics. So. In conclusion, so it says, does Uber need American transit tax medallion upside? You, you might be wondering, what, where is this going? Finally, although Uber is suing addict, people must not forget the following NYC market dynamics. So we wrote this on July 8th. NYC is a very unique market for Uber and Lyft, not only because of its size, but also due to drivers paying for commercial liability insurance and needing a commercial driver's license when using Uber X plus Lyft's equivalent. For example, a driver servicing an Uber X trip in Miami does not need to have a commercial driver's license or commercial vehicle plate that can keep their regular non-commercial Florida plates. How is that possible? What's happening is Uber and Lyft are actually providing the commercial liability cover while the Miami driver is logged into the app. This insurance dynamic is often cited as the justification for why Uber and Lyft might take, you know, 20, 30, 40% plus of a trips fare, you know, their take rate in markets outside of New York City. Now they're taking that take rate in New York City. So this is our last point here. In NYC, it appears Uber and Lyft have much lower operating costs because they're not directly paying for commercial liability insurance. Although if addicts not paying out, then they might be. So to be fair, in other words, NYC is not only a rev, a big revenue market, it's likely an even bigger profit center for the rideshare companies. However, they're relying on commercial liability insurers that drivers use, such as American Transit and Hereford to pay out claims in an efficient and proper manner. If this doesn't happen, that's a big problem. This is another way to frame why Uber is suing American Transit. So but FYI, we did look at uh, Hereford's Q2 statements. They act, they look pretty relatively healthy. They're definitely nothing like American Transit. So just FYI. So firstly, so let me explain what I what I just wrote there. OK, so to do UberX, and some of you might already get this, to do UberX uh, outside of New York City, like a lot of people just have their like regular DMV plates and then they do UberX. And so what people might not be realizing, if you look at Uber's SEC or Lyft's SEC filings, you actually realize that they actually have embedded insurance companies within uh, within their companies. So basically, let's say a guy in Miami, I just use, I'm just using Miami, but it honestly can apply to even like outside of New York City, New York State. But let's say there's an Uber X driver in Miami, he has his regular Florida DMV plates. What happens is when he logs onto the app and he does a trip, the Uber or Lyft's commercial insurance kicks in. And let's say he has Geico, the Geico insurance actually base effectively turns off. And he actually, they usually sign a waiver for that. Now, when he's off the apps, the Geico insurance is, is active still. But basically the insurance in the background is being often being paid by Uber and Lyft. That's a big expense. So when Uber and Lyft take 25, 30, 40% plus of a commission on the trip, a big justification for that in markets outside New York City is that they're paying for insurance. Okay, fair enough. 
in New York City, though, if if the driver is paying for insurance, but they're till, is still taking the same commission, that implies that the profit, the, the, the unit economics of a trip in New York City is very profitable. So that's that's I hope that makes sense. But that's what I mean by that dynamic. So Uber is specifically interested in maintaining that status quo. So it says, firstly, if but there's another angle to this, and this is how we will kind of conclude the article here, is that first, firstly, if American Transit is not paying out claims, that's obviously bad for Uber and Lyft. However, if Attic liquidates or goes through an operational restructuring, causing insurance prices that NYC drivers and fleets pay to spike, is that necessarily good for Uber or Lyft? Were fake, just think about what I'm saying here. <clears throat> were fake, quote unquote, insurance prices allowing Uber and Lyft to have, an, to have access to an unnaturally large NYC driver base, would a, would a more limited professional NYC TLC driver base actually empower drivers or the supply? The downside, of course, being thousands of drivers who might not make the actuarial cut, quote unquote, being permanently locked out of the apps and NYC for our transport market. And then we'll get to the last paragraph. Okay, so let me briefly explain that. I'm sure some of you are getting the point, what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that Uber and Lyft, the way they operate in other markets outside of New York City, New York City is a very unique market for, you know, they have a, if it's enforced properly, a TLC plate cap, an FHV license cap, so a limited amount of four hire vehicles, you need a license. Uh, it's, you know, it's, there's control mechanisms for that to get that license. Um, but in other markets, let's say using Miami, for example, you know, a, a driver is to Uber and Lyft again, this is how they might view it, is more disposable, if you will, because they have this, they have an infinity supply. If everybody who has regular DMV plates can basically, you know, log on to Uber and Lyft, then Uber will not hesitate to deactivate drivers or not like, you know, understand the nuance of why someone's getting deactivated. Now, don't get me wrong, there's legitimate reasons why Uber and Lyft have to deactivate drivers, but oftentimes in what happens, is that let's say a passenger complains, Uber and Lyft, from our understanding, speaking to a lot of drivers, will use this kind of like guilty until proven innocent thing where let's say a passenger says, well, the driver was rude to me, you know, so they'll just deactivate, then investigate versus investigate, then deactivate, especially when it's not, when it's something that's not like going to physically harm someone, they just, they just, they just deactivate them and they're willing to do that often because they're like, well, there's 10 people in line. We have more than enough supplies, so we don't need this person. So in New York City, Uber and Lyft, they don't have that infinity dynamic, what I call infinity supply dynamic. They only can send trips to TLC licensed drivers, of which there are about a little over 180,000, and uh, people who have access to a four hire vehicle license or TLC plate or a yellow cab. And there's, if you combine, there's like a hundred and eight, 9,000 TLC plates and like there's at a fully occupied yellow cab would be like another 13,500. But let's say right now there's like nine or 10,000. So they have access to like 117, 118,000, sorry, hundred, let's call it 120,000 to make life simple. Um, uh, well, technically it's like 118,000 right now, uh, like cars they can dispatch to. Our point here is that if is if you actually enforce, uh, if you force the insurance companies to be very particular about who they insure, which drivers they insure, the Uber and Lyft might have access to less drivers in New York City, which would in a weird way benefit those drivers who pass the actuarial cut, who can get insurance at an affordable price that they can afford, and it could empower them. However, for let's say the thousands of drivers who might not be able to get insurance because they're young or because they had a bad incident or a passenger messed up and got them, you know, got like a huge loss run that wasn't a, a claim that wasn't really their fault. Obviously, we don't want to see that happen as well in an unfair way. But in a weird way, it's a very like technical point, stricter insurance regulations and actual, you know, underwriting in the New York City TLC insurance market over a long enough time period might actually empower the supply of drivers. And in terms of TLC plates of that hundred and uh, of that hundred and you know, 9,000 we're referencing, give or take, 
you know, 60, 70% are actually in an, in, and this is an important fact for the last paragraph, of the article are individually claimed. So the FHV license is in the person's name versus like a corporation's name. Yeah, that's a very important note for our last point here. So I think you got the point what we're making, but obviously you have comments about that, um, you know, let us know. So finally, any loss of TLC plates, FHV licenses related to the inability of a driver or fleet to qualify for insurance will likely decrease total for higher vehicle supply. So if you can't get insurance, and like we just said, 60 or 70% are, are TLC plates are claimed in an individual's name, you're basically going to use your TLC plate. Um, this might benefit the yellow cab sector. The tax medallion could be viewed as an attractive scarce asset that an individual, we don't own any tax medallions, by the way, the tax medallion could be viewed as an attractive scarce asset that an individual or company cannot lose due to the inability to get insurance in the same way a person might technically lose a TLC plate. So basically in some way what we mean, and you know, this is again, a, a fairly technical point, but I think the yellow I think people in the industry will understand what we're saying. We're saying that if a TLC plate is claimed in an individual's name and that individual can't get insurance, then there's a risk of losing the TLC plate. But a tax medallion can, can be easily transferred by a corporations and names. So you can't, it's very hard to lose a tax medallion asset via insurance. You know, so let's say a corporation has horrible insurance. I think, and you know, don't, there's not financial advice, but let's say that corporation is insurance, that corporation could sell the tax medallion to another corporation. Let's say that as a, you know, that's a new corporation that has like a clean record or they get a new driver, but very few people are probably going to lose a tax medallion because they can't get insurance on their entity or a driver that either just change the driver or change the entity or do something like that. It's more, it's more easily transferable. So super like quirky point, I, you know, or maybe it's not a quirky point to a lot of you out there, but it actually could make a tax medallion interesting because of that transferability that's much more cleaner than a than a TLC plate. And obviously you can't even sell a TLC plate if it's individually owned. So if you're watching this and you're like, oh, I want to buy a TLC, just know and we'll do more uh, videos on this, but you cannot buy, no matter what anybody says, a TLC plate that is owned by an individual. There's no way to do that. You can rent it from the person, like, you know, lease the plate, but you cannot buy that TLC plate, no matter what they say, it's not a transferable asset when in owned in an individual name, you can, if you, if you, if your FHG license are attached to a corporation, you could technically sell the corporation, but we'll get into that. There's all sorts of other stuff you have to check for to transfer that, but it'll, it'll, it'll still lead to the tax medallion being a, a much more transferable asset, especially when you layer on this insurance thing. Okay. So we'll kind of end it there. So what we usually do is that like you go over all these articles so you know we we're going to provide the links to all of this so there's the dfs site there's an interesting article from the university of chicago christman in, uh, uh, initiative that goes kind of describes like last resort insurance in a simple way uh this is the article that we cited that you know maybe we made too big of a deal of this but if you want more insight uh, american transit might reach a settlement and that lawsuit then uh this article is about an overview like this is back in february's american transit too big to fail and in these articles like in our humble opinion um if you read these articles like we kind of lay it out and you know these articles take five to ten minutes to read we lay it out so you have a really you know how big is the market what are the commissions who are the market share leaders um and different dynamics so we kind of lay it out in these articles um we explain what tlc insurance is Okay, that's that two, three and a half percent driver pay increase we're talking about that the inflation index is not prop, the TLC driver pay adjustment is not properly accounting for. Then we mentioned that, you know, when Chair Doe said the art, which he correctly said, to be fair, I think that's a fair statement he said during the city council hearing that they're probably artificially low, talking about that. Um, and even just in passing, I don't want to get too much into it, but there's a much smaller player, Maya, that might also be in trouble, but obviously American trend is the bigger story. We talk about the lawsuit lending industry and the background to that also known as the car accident loan industry and our own experience with that industry being a small, you know, for those who know us, we, we started in this industry as a small fleet owner. Um, so there's kind of a story in there when we were sued for uh, $50 million, which is kind of an interesting story. Um, 
and you know we assure you nothing uh you know it wasn't as big of a you know it got settled for much less than that let's say like 10 to 12,000 in the insurance company. Basically a frivolous claim is our point, but read the article. Then we have this interview with Dan uh, Bratchpiss, uh, uh, which who is the CEO and co-founder of Insure. Very knowledgeable guy um, in the insurance industry. Uh, and we also have this interview with uh, Louis Cavedo from NYAB, which is a big uh, uh, insurance broker, one of the largest in the TLC industry. Then finally, just to be fair to the TLC, in terms of that inflation point we made, uh, in their latest regulatory agenda, they did kind of a, they did kind of address that, saying that revised driver expense portion of payrolls for high volume services, amend payrolls, and update methodology of calculating drivers' expenses. Okay, hopefully this wasn't too long. Hopefully it was useful. Let us know any comments or questions. Thanks a lot for joining us. And until next time, see you then.